It's when the cold front comes through, as we're used to seeing, that we're going to get that extra push and lift for potential severe weather. We're going to feel the impacts well outside of these outside lines because the cone has nothing to do with storm size. Houston, up to the woodlands along Interstate 45, we have that threat for heavy rainfall because tropical systems, they don't just impact the coast, there are inland threats as well. The impacts, it's all with that rain. Remember, low pressure systems, all of them, they rotate counterclockwise, which means that with that rotation, we're just going to continue to pick up moisture from the Gulf and funnel it into southeastern Texas. The storm chances will be a little bit spottier in nature, but that's where some of those single cells could become a bit more intense. The leading edge, that's where we would have that concern for damaging wind gusts. And then, of course, within the storm, that potential for exceptionally heavy rainfall. In terms of what are we seeing with the dynamics of this, system. I'll be honest, it has been off and on showing some indications of rotation, not quite as apparent as when the warning was first issued. Part of the reason why a lot of the nation has been in a relatively tranquil pattern is because the jet stream has been pushed way to the north, a very summer like pattern, but that changes late this week. The trough intensifies over the western United States that adds some energy to the atmosphere, but it also changes up the temperature pattern. Now, before I show you today's headlines, I just want to remind you I am the messenger. If you have a problem with today's forecast, take it up with Mother Nature or Patrick if you want to. What? Four feet of snow with one storm at the end of September. People at home are probably thinking like, it's wow, there, there's some weather geeks. They're getting really excited about this it's snow, crazy. but it was historic. My producer, Alex, though, he wants to do spring training in Chicago in hey, February. You know, it would, uh, it would make those players a little tougher, I think. Are you saying baseball players aren't tough? We're going to get emails. They Send play them to football Vicky. in the Send snow. Send them to Vicky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Oh, man. A bit more snow Has before the week's Has anyone ever told you that you should go into sales? <laughs> yeah, Gosh, no. you, you sold that Duluth camera like none other. Yeah, I mean, hey, you know what? Next time uh, next time it's warm there in Duluth, uh, I will make it up to the Chamber of Commerce there, and we'll talk about that. But Okay, I'll um, see you in June. Yeah, we'll see you in June there in, in Duluth, <laughs> exactly. We're going to do round two coming up later this week. I was going to say, this really isn't even the main event. We're going to see a more potent system arriving by Thursday and Friday. So you heard what Joe said, folks. This is just <laughs> the appetizer. And now we're really taking aim for portions of Georgia and both South and North Carolina. Yeah, because with every passing hour, this system's just going to shift further to the north. So if you're joining us from the Carolinas or even Virginia, any final preparations need to be rushed to completion because as we look ahead to your Thursday and then into the end of the week and this upcoming weekend, that's where we're going to see the closest impacts or the majority of the impacts associated with Dorian anywhere from from South Carolina further to the north and you'll notice that the watches and warnings continue to expand up the eastern shores of the United States. Now we have that hurricane warning extend all the way to the North Carolina Virginia border in anticipation of hurricane force conditions arriving within the next 36 hours. So again, every county further north you head, you have a couple extra moments to do your final preparations. And I just want to emphasize that this storm should not be taken lightly because we are not ruling out landfall into one or both of the Carolinas as we go throughout the next couple of days. In addition to just the sheer winds that we're going to deal with, we've also got to be concerned, of course, with that storm surge. As Greg mentioned, winds are now moving offshore in Florida. That's going to push the water out. But as the system tracks to the north, we're going to be seeing that perpendicular approach to many of the coastlines of the Carolinas. And that means direct push of all of the water inland across the outer ba banks, the intercoastal waterways. We've got a lot of low lying also marshland across the area, all very susceptible to that storm surge inundation and flooding. So we'll continue to watch the storm again, track very slowly to the north, eventually making hopefully more of that northeasterly turn. But notice how close we are. We could be seeing the system either skirt and clip the coastline or move inland as we look ahead to Thursday and Friday. So I want to emphasize that all of those different possibilities, those different types, offshore skirting coastline or moving inland with landfall are all three still potential outcomes with this system. And as it skirts the coast, we're also going to have to look out for that tornado potential as well as a flash flooding potential. This will also be a large story for folks on the coast as well as inland, where we could be easily seeing a half a foot of rain 
or more through the end of the work week, which could lead to significant flash flooding concerns. More Hurricane Dorian coverage coming up here at Weather Nation. We'll keep tabs on places like Tybee Island as that surf pushes in.